people are going to be somehow deceived. You know, we live in an age today where some, so many people say, oh, but he's so sincere. You know, you could say, well, this thing is wrong and that's evil. So, well, I know that, but he is so sincere, you know. I'm sure that Lucifer was very sincere when he disobeyed God, but he was cast into hell. Adam and Eve were very sincere, and they were cast out of the garden of paradise. The communists are very sincere and very dedicated, but they're wrong in what they're doing. Before St. Paul was converted, he was sincere also. I don't find anything in the Bible that says, all those who are sincere shall be saved. No, we must believe that Christ was the Redeemer and the Messiah. We must belong to that church that he founded and cooperate with the graces he gives to us. Obey him, obey the teachings of the church, and then we'll save our souls. If we go contrary to God and his law, again I repeat, and die in the state of mortal sin, we're going to lose our souls. Are we now living in that age of confusion, of great falling away? I remember in the year 1960 or thereabouts, living in San Diego, California, when our parish priest told us that there was going to be a council, Vatican Council II, and the purpose of Vatican Council II was to bring about unity. So instead of having all of these religions all over the face of the earth, the goal of Vatican II supposedly was to unite everyone and there'd be no more confusion. Now, there was a time when at least Catholics used to believe the same thing. But since 1960, the over 20 years, instead of seeing unity, now the Catholics don't even agree. Think about it. The unique thing about those who call themselves Catholics, no matter where they were from, no matter what language they spoke, no matter what age they lived in, same faith, same sacraments, same mass, same teaching. Today, as we go around and preach, we run into right-wing Catholics, left-wing Catholics, traditionalists, progressives, pro-Vatican II, anti-Vatican II. God knows how many different so-called Catholics are out today, how many groups are represented today. Now, I am not attacking Catholicism. I am a Catholic, was born a Catholic, and want to die a Catholic. But can you imagine someone who is not a Catholic, reading an old Catholic catechism, believing what he reads, saying to himself, I will become a Catholic today. God knows what he's going to end up believing. You probably start going knocking on rectory doors and finding out that the priests don't agree with one another. The bishops don't agree with one another. Suppose he comes to a hall like this here and expects to find Catholic, and he starts walking around talking to the individuals here who call themselves Catholics. There are some that don't believe in Vatican II. There are some that follow Vatican II. There are some that half believe Vatican II and half don't believe Vatican II. Now, he wants to become a Catholic. What church is he going to join? Well, in the Catechism it says, the Catholic Church was founded by Christ. That church was commissioned to teach the truth. It has taught the same truth through the centuries. It never changes its teachings. That's what it says in the Old Catechism. So he comes in here and hears all these different opinions amongst those that call themselves Catholic. Well, maybe that person would shrug his shoulders and say, well, I guess I've got to look elsewhere. This catechism must be lying. Or, if he read on in the catechism, he would find the words, the church that was founded by Christ can be identified. It has four marks. One, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. If there are five different groups all referring to themselves as members of the church that was founded by Christ, and they disagree with one another, these four marks only fit in one of those five, if the truth is represented there. Now, I know that before Vatican II came about, that the Catholic school that I attended and the Catholic churches that I went to had those four marks. I've talked to men that were in the service that went overseas during the war and went to the Catholic churches in Germany and in France and in Italy, and it was the same mass that they saw in their parishes here in this country. Exactly the same thing. They used their same missiles. 
While the priest said Mass in Latin and gave a sermon in German or French or whatever, they could at least follow the Mass in English or French or Spanish, whatever their vernacular tongue was. Now, there is a difference in the churches now as compared to the way they were before Vatican II. If someone stands up and says, okay, you want to become Catholic? You come with me. We have a real old traditional priest right down the line. Has nothing to do with Vatican II. Never says the old liturgy. Just says the old Latin mass. You come with us. and we'll, He's going to teach you the faith and you'll be Catholic. But don't hang around with those people. They're heretics. So someone else stands up and says, wait a minute. He's got it backwards. You come with us and this priest is very obedient. He follows everything about Vatican II. Says the new liturgy. But you must avoid those traditionalists, you see, because they're heretics. They're way out. So again, here's this non-Catholic crying out loud. Christ didn't find two churches, did he? He didn't found two churches. He founded one church. Now, what church is he going to join? Now, you can't say there's no difference because these two groups call one another heretics. I've heard them firsthand scream at one another. You're a heretic. You've left the Catholic Church. You belong to a new religion. You can't join two churches. You can't be members of two churches at the same time. If someone is anti-Vatican II and someone is pro-Vatican II, one of them has to be wrong. Let's take the four marks of the church that was founded by Christ and see if they fit in the Vatican II church. The church founded by Christ is one. One in its belief. One set of teachings, one doctrine. I'm sure that you're aware of the fact that in the past 20 years you've seen articles in modern Catholic newspapers such as, is it necessary for babies to be baptized? Are there really angels? Is it possible to commit a mortal sin? Did Adam and Eve commit original sin? Was there an Adam and Eve? Did Jesus have brothers and sisters? And on and on and on and on. All of those things that we were taught in school to be fact. This is black, this is white. Now, all of a sudden, there have to be these big discussions. You know, this expert from that country made a discovery. There's no Adam and Eve. He's going to try to prove it. Or there are no angels. So today, instead of seeing one doctrine, one set of teachings, everyone has their own opinions. On this mission, I've had three or four priests from California tell me that in the pulpit in the church they went to, the priest said there was no purgatory. Now, that's an article of faith. If you don't believe there's a purgatory, you cease to be Catholic because that is an article of faith. If you deny one of the teachings of the Catholic Church, you cease to be a Catholic. Again, that philosophy, all you have to do is be sincere. There are so many weird teachings coming forth today out of the mouths of priests and nuns and bishops and cardinals. Something is wrong somewhere. That's why the majority of those people that call themselves Catholics and remember the way it used to be are confused. I don't see unity. I see just the opposite. Chaos. The church founded by Christ is holy. It has seven sacraments. The sacraments, again, I repeat, produce grace when they're received validly. Are the sacraments in the Vatican II Church the same way or the same as they were before Vatican II? Now, again, remember, Christ is the one that instituted the seven sacraments. He did not say to the apostles, you may now go and destroy the sacraments. He commissioned the apostles to go forth and to preach. And if anyone were to say to a Catholic priest or to a Catholic bishop, where do you get your authority? Where does the Catholic Church get its authority to teach? Read in the Bible. As the Father has sent me, I send you. He who hears you, hears me. Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And he so-called born-agains that go around with fake Bibles in their hands and try to use the Bible to prove the Catholic Church is not the true church, are doing a little bit of twisting around. They don't even know that the Catholic Church is the one who put forth the Bible. That's where the Bible came from. 
And every year now there's a new Bible. And it's more perverted than the one before. Are the sacraments the same? You don't have to be too brilliant to know that what's going on in the sanctuary today is not what went on in the sanctuary 20 years ago. I think you could be blind and tell there was a difference by the noise that's coming out. I was told by my parish priest in San Diego, as you were no doubt told by your parish priest, that there were going to be a few changes in the liturgy. Few changes in the liturgy. And the reason for these changes is so that it would become more meaningful. Now here's what happened. I'll go over it briefly. The three Hail Marys, the Hail Holy Queen, and the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel just disappeared. We were never told why. It just stopped. The last gospel disappeared. All of a sudden, there were new translations for the epistles and the gospels, translations that were heretical. All of a sudden, the table appears in the sanctuary. The priest stands with his back to God and faces the people. The people are told to stand up to receive Holy Communion. Tabernacles are put off in the side. Crucifixes come down. Statues disappear. Weird, ugly art replaces the beautiful art. People dancing in the sanctuary, bongo drums and guitars, balloons let off at the offertory by kids, movies going on in the sanctuary. That's the holy sacrifice of the Mass. That's more meaningful. You want to know why your teenage son and your teenage daughter are bored stiff when they go to church? That's why. There's nothing there. It's like a three-ring circus. And they know it. If you're having problems with your kids, that's why. You wonder why your once Catholic son or daughter are becoming Jehovah Witnesses or Baptists or Mormons or any other religion because they know that this new stuff is nothing there. And these poor kids are out seeking for the truth. Now, I want you to remember what we're talking about. We're not saying that Catholicism is wrong. We believe in Catholicism. But there is something wrong. Something drastically wrong. As this liturgy was changing by degrees... Finally, in 1967, I remember very clearly, November of 1967, the liturgy was now going to be in the vernacular. English, Spanish, French, whatever. And I remember how they put it forth. So that you will understand what's going on now, we're going to put the liturgy in your language. Like we've been a bunch of dummies, you know, for centuries. We had no idea what was going on. When I was seven years old, I could read and follow in my missile. Now, the reason they gave again was that you would better understand, right? Why did the so-called experts who translated Latin into the different languages, why was it necessary for them to translate when they already had English or Spanish or French versions right in your old St. Joseph's Missal, right? Approved translations by the Vatican. Why didn't they just take those translations, type them up on bigger pages, and make another missile for the priest out of those already approved translations? But no, that's not what happened. The experts translated from Latin to the vernacular languages, and you know what happened? All of the experts made the same mistake. Now, that's pretty far-fetched to think that that could be an accident, right? These changes just didn't come about by accident. They were planned. But well, what do you mean they made a mistake? If you were to take your old St. Joseph's Missal, look where the words of consecration are, compare them with the vernacular words of consecration in the new liturgy, in the vernacular, they're not the same. You know what some people say? Well, so what? When it comes to the sacraments, you had better be concerned because if the words are not the same, there's no mass. That's what priests were taught in the seminary. That's what I was taught when I was studying sacramental theology. A priest just doesn't get bread and wine and go up there and do his own thing, and all of a sudden that becomes the body and blood of Christ. He must say the words that Christ said at the Last Supper. And the Catholic Church can't change the words of Christ. It doesn't make sense. It's the role of the Catholic Church to preserve the words of Christ and the teachings of Christ. Unfortunately... As lay people, you find yourselves now in a position today that 
normally lay people wouldn't be in. We were told by the nuns, you do what Father tells you, you do what the bishop says, period. But again, you can't do a hundred different things at the same time. Every priest does his own thing. So you have to now investigate. And if you don't investigate and look into these things, you're going to continue to be confused. I have with me here a decree, a copy of a decree written by Pope St. Pius V, and it has to do with the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Now, for every sacrament, unless you're, you're not aware of this, we'll do it very briefly, for every sacrament there are three things necessary for the sacrament to be valid. Proper matter, proper form, and proper intention. Let's use baptism as an example. Proper matter, water. Proper form, I baptize thee in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Intention, I intend to remove original sin. Suppose a priest comes up and uses milk. There's no water around. There's no baptism. Suppose a priest says, I baptize thee in the name of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Sounds nice, but it's not the right words. So there's no baptism. If the priest doesn't have the right intention, there's no baptism. This is the same case with all of the sacraments. The Mass... Priests must use bread and wine, the bread and wine prescribed by the church. There are rules and regulations laid down about the type of bread and wine. The priest must say the words that Christ said at the Last Supper, and he must intend to change that bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. Now, we'll just take one aspect, the form, the words. This decree of Pope St. Pius V says, the words of consecration, which are the formative principle of the sacrament, the form of the sacrament, are as follows. For this is my body, over the bread. For this is the chalice of my blood, of the new and everlasting testament, the mystery of faith, which shall be shed for you and for many, unto the remission of sins. Now in your old missiles, these words were found in Latin on one side, English, French, German, Spanish, whatever on the other side. They were written in bold black letters or bold red letters, okay? The Pope goes on to say, if any omission... Or alteration is made in the formula of consecration of the body and blood involving a change of meaning, the consecration is invalid. Every single priest that went to the seminary was taught this. In 1967, as we said already about five times, in the so-called translated versions into the vernacular versions, you find these words. This is the cup of my blood, which shall be shed for you and for all men, so that sins may be remitted. It's not what our Lord said at the Last Supper. He used the words, for many unto the remission of sin, not for all men. There's a difference between many and all. Now, I have gone to at least a hundred priests in the past 20 years and have talked about this here. And you know what most of them say? Many and all mean the same thing. Now, I can go to a five-year-old, and they'll tell me there's a difference. When this verse came out, we went out the first day, knocked on the doors of 20 priests in Spokane, Washington, and said, Father, and we showed them the difference. Some of them said, don't worry about it. Others said, many and all mean the same thing. Others said, the pendulum is here, it's going to swing to the right, it's going to come to rest in the middle. Whatever that has to do with words of consecration, I still can't figure out. We did not get one logical, sensible answer. I am worried about it. Because according to the teachings of the church, if the right words are not used and there's a different meaning, there is no holy sacrifice of the Mass. Then maybe you're tempted to say, you mean to tell me that all of the priests and all of the bishops and all of the people are deceived. If they're doing something that's wrong, yes, underlined a million times. If a priest does not say the right words of consecration, there is no mass. The people receive a piece of bread. And the way they receive it today, it's not difficult in believing that they receive a piece of bread. Hosts found on the floor, people taking the host home, picking it up in their hand that's supposed to be the body and blood of Christ. Do you know what Daniel the prophet said in the Old Testament? There will come a time when the continual sacrifice will cease to exist and in its place will be the abomination of desolation. That's what Daniel the prophet said. 
He was predicting that there would come a time when the holy sacrifice of the Mass, for the most part, would cease. And instead of the holy sacrifice of the Mass would be the abomination of desolation. I would challenge all of you here in this hall tonight to take the time, review the teachings of Holy Mother of the Church, even in your Baltimore Catechism and Simple Theology book regarding the sacraments, and compare them, compare those teachings and those sacraments with what's going on today in the Vatican II Church. If you do this and pray as you're doing it, you're going to be made aware of the fact that there is a definite difference. But do you know what's very difficult today in convincing people to research? Twenty-five years ago, if someone were to stand up, stood up and said that you don't have a valid mass in your parish, They'd probably all have a stroke. It would be some kind of a revolution. Today, it's like people are mesmerized. You know, like the attitude, what can I do about it? It's unbelievable, the reaction. It's like you're telling me it's raining outside. We're saying literally that the liturgy in your parish, in your local parish, is not a valid liturgy. And I can prove it by repeating the words of Pope St. Pius V. The words of consecration were destroyed. You know how most people research what we say? Some of them do it during the lecture. What do you think? Boy, that's a lot right. So two seconds of research, they just made a comment to one another. Or others will go knock on the parish door, parish priest's door, you know. Father, are you saying a valid mass? I think he's going to say, no, I'm not. Invalid. Make sure you come to it. They'll say, do you think they're going to say, Father, is Vatican II a Catholic council? I think he's going to say, no. You have to, on your own, look into it and investigate. And if you don't, whether you agree or disagree with what I'm saying, if you don't research it, you cannot make a statement that what I'm saying is not true. Just because you don't agree with it doesn't mean that it's not true. You may say, well, just because you're saying it doesn't mean it's true. Okay, look into it. Research it yourself and find out yourself by research. But don't make a judgment just because you don't like what you hear or because you have the attitude it can't be. I remember when Catholics were taught that when someone was baptized, original sin was removed from the soul. And in the new rite of baptism, you know what the emphasis is on? Being initiated into the Christian community. And if any of the priests follow the philosophy of Teilhard de Chardin, I'm sure you've heard of him, most of you. Chardin was a Jesuit heretic. And Chardin taught that body and soul of man was in a continual process of evolution. Just think of this. And eventually man would become like Christ. So we're all going to evolve into gods, I guess. And he did not look upon original sin as a stain on the soul. It just represented the fallen nature of mankind. So if he doesn't believe there's a stain on the soul, how in the heck is he going to remove it? He doesn't even believe in it. So if you have Chardinian priests, they're not even validly baptizing. Go through all the sacraments. You want to get married in the Vatican II church? You can go into a Lutheran church, an Episcopalian church, you can go into a synagogue. You can have a rabbi come into Catholic church and have a joint ceremony. You can write your own ceremony, and I guess if it doesn't work out, you can get annulled. I actually had a woman come to me the other day in Colorado with a, she was married in 1959, and she came up to me with an envelope, and she says, here's my marriage papers, can I get an annulment? I said, what are you talking about, an annulment? You're validly married in a church, right? She says, yes, but my husband left me. And I said, well, I'm sorry that your husband left you, but you can't get an annulment. An annulment is a declaration that there was no marriage to begin with. That's what an annulment is. But in the Vatican II Church, you can go to the board that they have, the commission. They usually have a psychiatrist on that commission. And if you have a session with a psychiatrist and convince him that you didn't realize what you were doing 30 years ago when you married Johnny, then you get an annulment. And everyone is doing it. In Phoenix, Arizona, two years ago, 3,000 annulments. Why don't they call it divorce and call it for what it is? Because it is divorce. Extreme unction is not called extreme unction anymore. It's the sacrament of the sick. 
Every once in a while in different parishes, the people that are sick gather together and they receive the blessing of the sick. Now, extreme unction was an anointing with holy oil when there was a danger of death. Again, they don't even call it the same thing. This is true with all of the sacraments. Now, the sacraments produce grace. Cooperation with grace produces holiness, and that's one of the marks of the church. Instead of seeing holiness since Vatican II, we have seen confusion, nuns leaving the convent, priests not functioning as priests, getting married, mass defections, and worst of all, little kids, millions and millions of little kids being marched off to school every day and being brought up in a brand new religion. And I know that firsthand. I've gone into hundreds of schools and have talked to children about things that we were taught, and especially today, they don't even know what we're talking about. The catechisms aren't the same. We don't call those books catechism. We have a file where we have forces of error listed there, and all of those books are listed in that file. Forces of error, brand new teachings, heretical teachings, ambiguous teachings, perverted art, is supposed to be catechism. Okay, that's two marks of the church. Go on to the third mark. Catholic, that means universal, that's what the word means. There was a time when you could go anywhere on the face of the earth and walk into a Catholic church, as we've already said, and you knew you were in a Catholic church. Today, every single church is different. Right in this diocese, you go from one church to the next, it's completely different, depending on what the priest wants to do. The church founded by Christ is apostolic. It was founded on the apostles. And you remember how the apostles were commissioned by Christ to go forth and to convert, preach to the Jews and convert the Jews, preach to the Gentiles and convert the Gentiles. And then the missionaries went in all of the different countries and tried to convert the inhabitants of those countries. Do you know what you're being told today from the pulpits instead of conversion? You are being told to go into the Protestant churches, into the synagogues. We were taught by the nuns it was a sin. Remember that? We used to lay our heads down in a desk and a sister would say, we're going to make an examination of conscience. Did you go into a non-Catholic church? If you did, you must confess it to Father. And then later on we were taught... If in going into a non-Catholic church, we actually took part in the service, we were excommunicated from the church. There are papal decrees that point this out. Now, all of a sudden, you're supposed to go into the local churches, wrap your arms around one another and smile and forget about all of the different beliefs. Just love one another. Now, our Lord said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's how you prove your love for God. You don't love your neighbor who doesn't have the truth by refusing to tell him the truth. So as difficult as it may be for some to understand and accept, and we're being very brief here, believe it or not, is that the four marks that are found in the church, which was founded by Christ, are not found in the Vatican II church. What are we suggesting you do? Cease being Catholic? Just the opposite. We're suggesting that you investigate and see whether or not the church that you belong to is Catholic. What do I mean by that? People will come up to me after election and say, boy, you are so different from the way we are. And I'll say to those people, the reason we're different is because you've changed. Don't blame me. I still use the same old catechism, still say the same mass, still believe the same things that the nuns taught us when we went to Catholic school. If you don't, you have changed, and that's why we're different. Our bishop was on the radio several days ago in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I listened to part of the radio program, and the woman that was interviewing him says, well, you've done just what Martin Luther did. And listen, this is how he replied. Martin Luther founded a new religion. He left the Catholic Church. He changed his teachings. We haven't. The bulk of the people have changed their teachings, so they've done what Martin Luther has done. Only there's more of them now. So again, I repeat, we have not started anything new. We've just stayed with the way it was. Again, we were taught that the truth cannot change. 
When our Blessed Mother came to Fatima in 1917, she left a message. If this message were lived, we would not see the mess that we have around us today, both in the church and out in the world.